So a few months ago, I was playing brass with my family. And when I taught the game, I said it's super complicated. It's like watching Tenet without subtitles. So we played, we finished a game, and as soon as it was done, they were like, oh, this game was so much easier than other games we've played. It was then I realized I'm the fool. It's not super complicated, but instead incredibly deep. So I wanted to take a dive into complexity and depth and see how these two are intertwined with regards to board gaming. To tame my ADHD demons, I made a list from zero to 10, ever increasing in complexity like a group order at Starbucks. But I also wanted to talk about how deep I think each game is. Since depth and complexity are often considered equivalent, kind of like facts and opinions, I wanted to do a 100% factual and accurate guide of game complexity without any biases whatsoever. First, let's start off with some quick definitions to keep us on the same page. So complexity, this is the total effort in order to learn and operate a game in accordance with its rules. Simply put, it's everything you need to know before and during a board game to run it properly. Rules, check. components, check. endless admin fussiness, check. unintuitive mechanics, check. the sheer volume of content, Everything you need to do from reading or watching guides to having constantly reference the rulebook to managing all the administrative nuance. That's all part of complexity. A complex board game takes more work to play. Depth is the game's decision space and room for meaningful improvement and growth. So depth is the level of growth that's possible from multiple plays, as well as the ability to express scale throughout a singular session of a game. A game has to let you get good, and the extent of how good someone can get is often correlated with how deep it is. So if someone has played a ton, researched, theorized, experimented, that player has the capacity to then send opponents to the Shadow Realm. A deep game allows for a wide range of decisions and meaningful expression of skill that creates a tangible gap in players' performances. But wait, what about weight? Okay, quick surprise definition. If you come from BGG, you'll know all about weight. It's their ambiguous metric to know how heavy a game is. It's defined by the individual user. So weight can be complexity to one, depth to another, and any other numerous factors that they might be feeling at a time. To me, weight seems to be decided by three things. It's complexity plus depth plus time. I personally wouldn't worry too much about weight. There's a lot of weird things that we could discuss regarding it, but for the interest of this list, I'll put it as another reference point. But I hope that just by doing that, it sufficiently demonstrates why I think weight isn't the perfect system to begin with. <laughs> Shape sorters, Candyland, complexity zero, depth zero. Weight 1.12 out of five, the same as a game like Skull. At complexity zero, we got Candyland. There is no complexity, there is no depth. There really isn't even a game. Candyland is a task. It's just doing what's instructed of you. You draw a card, go to a match in space, and that's it. You will never make a decision. There is never a choice. It's a task. You are doing a task. Sure, you learn how to play. Candyland is a teaching tool for future games. People, young and old, will be able to learn turn order or what it means to win or lose or even the concept of rules but there isn't any form of complexity to the game and there isn't any depth you can study candyland for decades and an infant will have an equal likelihood to win it's all based on if the cards decide it to be so you can never get better and the game is so simple it's akin to putting a colored cube in the right box the red card takes you to red square the purple card takes you to purple square until the heat death of the universe it's zero for both complexity and depth. <laughs> Next up, we got games for the elderly. For this one, I'm using Camel Up as my example, with a complexity of one and a depth of two. The weight is 1.50 out of five, where Monopoly is a 1.62. So at the complexity of one, we have the lightest of family games. These are games you'll find in your Targets or JCPenney's or whatever. You know, the ones that have garbage movies made out of them. And at this level, we got Camel Up, the high energy, goofy gambling game, because I find this to be the best game at this introduction level. 
Camel Up is so easy to learn because gambling is already taught by our risk prone culture and you're betting on funny shaped camels. And it's a race. We know what it means to win a race. It's just camels. You just bet on camels. So then all you need to know is the five possible actions in the game to actually play. Since each action takes about 10 seconds to teach, that's less than a minute to demonstrate the full game. It's pretty dang simple and perfectly approachable for people who have never played a board game before, period. That said, Camel Up has a knee deep level of depth because the game is ultimately playing odds, taking risk for potentially sweet rewards and predicting outcomes based on ever increasing information. You're rewarded for making the correct bets before more information is revealed. And sometimes that optimal play isn't entirely clear. Yeah, you're never gonna win every game, but if you run the numbers and get lucky, you'll be able to win more than you think. The game definitely presents a real puzzle that can be optimized, but the randomness is too great to allow for dominant mastery of the game. So yeah, you can bet smart, you can take risk and hope it pays off, but ultimately it's a simple game with a core puzzle, which is perfect for elderly people who like to gamble without spending their savings. I am uncomfy when I don't know what to do tier. For this game, I'm picking Secret Hitler with a complexity of two and a depth of one. The weight of Secret Hitler is 1.74, and for comparison, Checkers is 1.72. At level two complexity, we're talking about games with interesting mechanics, but have a teeny tiny rule set so you never struggle with what to do next. It's for those who want to play a game, but not to be challenged. You can avoid a lot of administrative overhead and preparation while still diving into novel ideas. Really, it's a comfortable space that a lot of games occupy. And I picked Secret Hitler as my example because I've talked a lot about this before, but I have a love-hate relationship with it. Secret Hitler has a complexity of two because while it presents itself as a serious game with political intrigue, agendas, unique roles, board effects, and voting, the gameplay loop is a watered-down version of Avalon. It's a straightforward game mechanically, but is dressed in layers of real-world politics. Playing the majority of the game is as simple as voting on a combo of players and then watching and reacting to what agenda is played. If you are chosen as the president or chancellor, sure, you can pick which agenda, but even that is a fairly linear decision tree. The ankle deep complexity arises from the concept of hidden loyalties more than the actual gameplay mechanics. Because if you're brand new to board games, the idea of a traitor or a hidden team can be a bit confusing. But then again, people with object permanence should be able to understand that there's a loyalty card in that envelope. And it's not that hard people. So there, a two out of 10 for complexity. From a depth perspective, Secret Hitler is not a deep game. The game's central mechanic of an agenda deck is so rubber bandy that even if a team is playing perfectly, the game will automatically swing to the other side. This is by design, as the game wants to reach a dramatic finish, and in order to do so, it must create a scenario of a close game. In other words, no matter how good you think you are, you are hamstrung by the rubber band in the agenda deck, which is designed to create a tense story. You can't get good at Secret Hitler, and that's by design. The game wants to tell a story with a sensational finale where anything can happen and victory is so close on both sides. But in order to do so, player agency is removed and overwhelmed by a rubber band. The depth is stripped away and replaced by a guiding hand that uses probability to set the path towards a climactic and memorable finish. It's a one out of 10 for depth. The Cardboard Wall. For this one, Settlers of Catan, with a complexity of three and a depth of three. The weight is 2.29 out of five, and a game like Dominion, another popular entry-level game, is a 2.35. At complexity of three, we reach the sacred entry level. These games are the barrier between people who are normal and people who play games. Because once you play one of these games, you'll be forever tainted as a board gamer. There is a blossom in tolerance for rules, administration, and a patience to learn when you get to this level of complexity. Of course, I had to pick the all-time classic of Settlers of Catan. Catan is the game that popularized modern board gaming back in 1995 and remains to this day as the cardboard gatekeeper between people who think Monopoly is the best board game of all time and those who have 300 games still in shrink wrap. 
the complexity of Catan is perfectly balanced for people who want to get into board games, but haven't dived headfirst into game manuals and hour-long YouTube guides. With the modern implementation of victory points, removal of player elimination, creating unique maps through hexagonal tiles, as well as encouraging table discussion through trades and negotiation, Catan still represents that barrier of entry into modern games. Now, from a depth perspective, Catan has a giant competitive scene because it's so insanely popular, and it has a well-implemented online community. But the game is only really at a 3 out of 10 depth from my perspective. Yes, absolutely, you can get good at Catan, but its ceiling is far lower than games that have refined the ideas that Catan brought to the table. Once you learn the theory and methodology, Catan is much more refinement than it is discovery. The game has a notorious reliance on luck and initial settlement placement. There are crush and dice rolls that happen frequently and can often quash strategies entirely. And the robber, the dang robber. It's still a game you can express skill, but the skill ceiling is so much lower than the games that came afterward that actually wanted to create a more competitive environment. In other words, Catan definitely ushered in the whole modern board game world, but so many games afterwards refined on the ideas it presented and made it more complex, nuanced, and balanced. Hence, 3 out of 10 for depth in Catan, my friends. And here we are at level 4. What do you mean I have to read? For this one, we're using Blood on the Clock Tower with a complexity of 4 and a depth of 9. The weight is 3.03 out of 5. Ah, at level 4 complexity, your reading comprehension is under scrutiny. Mechanics are now more complex and follow a more intense logic. Like, you gotta know transitive properties and be able to infer information. If A equals B and B equals C, C equals A, you know? Lots of effects are common and relationships between varied components are fleshed out. Blood on the Clock Tower is at that four level complexity. It has enough moving parts that understanding the roles and abilities of each player is a fair bit of work. It takes an active effort to actually understand what you can do and how your role works, as well as how you relate to other players and their abilities. You will have to learn that you are a smaller piece of a bigger puzzle which is the start of your journey of self-discovery and true enlightenment. Not to mention, being a storyteller in this game requires actual deep reading into the unique script and understanding the strange situations that can occur. There's even literal online quizzes, just like you're doing a driving school test. The game scales in difficulty depending on what script you choose, but even the easiest one has enough going on, it will take six or so playthroughs just before you understand all the interactions. The base concept is very easy to grasp in the same way as Secret Hitler, and if you have a good storyteller who introduces the game with safety mechanisms locked in, it can be a silky smooth learn. But it's still a 4 out of 10 in complexity because of all the moving parts, the various abilities, and unique game-to-game -game situations. Now, the depth is deeper than Elden Ring lore. At a ridiculous 9 out of 10, Blood on the Clock Tower is extremely deep and becomes progressively more skill dependent as the scripts become more complex and the bluffs are better understood. Because the game's core is so pure and the systems are so well tuned over the common ancestor of Mafia, the game both rewards logical thought as well as skillful bluffing, which is almost an infinite skill ceiling. The more you play, the more you realize what possibilities are available for you as an individual as well as you become increasingly better skilled at deducing what could be happening in a given scenario. There is mastery of both the social aspect and the deduction aspect, which is unmatched in any other social deduction game, which is why I give it a 9 out of 10 for depth. The only real blemish is that the storyteller has a duty to balance the game, so there can be situations such as the pacifist activation that can feel almost unfair and kind of anti-scale. But the storyteller swaying the direction of the game is good for the game's health as a whole, but can still be a slight detriment to the game's depth depending on what happens. Achy Breaky Brain. At level 5, complexity, we have Brass Birmingham, with also a depth of 9. The weight of this game is 3.88 out of 5, and chess is a 3.65. Ah, level 5 complexity. At this level, strong rule comprehension is key for success. 
Games crumble unless you know the inner workings of every single mechanic. Trying to house rule out of laziness or skip over some aspect of the game completely breaks it. You actually need to understand how to operate the game, otherwise it just won't be a good time. I'm using Brass Birmingham as the level 5 complexity because this game is intimidating, but not deservedly so. The game takes true effort to learn, and there is some subtlety in the manual that must be understood in order to play. Key concepts like what is your network and what is connected are often misunderstood by players, and the aspect of changing the rules halfway through the game takes a willingness to learn the game twice. Like, it's mostly the same, but a few key differences will mess you up if you aren't too careful. This game takes a lot of patience, and sometimes it feels like you're waiting in line at Disney World. That said, the game is still very approachable if you have that patience. There are only six actions, but unlike in Camel Up, each action has nuance and requires game knowledge to conduct properly. Which beer can I use? Which coal? Which iron? The game demands patience and you will need to refer to the rulebook often. But because the game is digestible and shockingly intuitive at times, it's only a 5 out of 10 complexity. On the other hand, the depth of Brass Birmingham is also near the top of the charts. The game works as almost an abstract game. Because of the vast array of possibilities, all seemingly valid, the game creates a giant network of possibilities within your mind. It's a cacophony of decisions that all scream and beg for your attention, and the pathway you go down also depends on a bit of friendly competition from your neighboring players. As each segment of the game winds to a conclusion, you can see the aftermath of all the terrible decisions and misplays you made, and you will feel like you have a better understanding of how to improve after each and every game. This is the reason why BGG weight is so high for this game. Not because it's absurdly complex, but because it's so deep. In the same way, it reminds me of chess. There's nuance to the rules, but the challenge of the game comes from depth not complicated rule sets. Now, why isn't this a 10 out of 10, you might ask? Well, the reason is that the competitive scene, there have been developments of some metas that seem to be a fair bit overwhelming. For example, the brick strategy is consistently touted as the strongest way to play from a mathematical standpoint. And I do think there is some truth to that. While the game is incredibly deep, it does feel like a meta strategy does exist and overwhelm a lot of the other game plans. So it just isn't there at a 10 out of 10 yet. Dude, where's my Kallax? For this level 6 of complexity, we have Dune Imperium Uprising. With that, it has a depth of 8 and a weight of 3.44 out of 5. Okay, at the level 6 complexity, you're officially in the obsession tier. This is the level where you got a Kallax or 2 or 12 and you're able to digest rule books like the back of breakfast cereal boxes. Rules and administrative tasks are all but a small stepping stone to new game mechanics and entertainment. Things like asymmetry, distinct game phases, variable powers, multiple resources, direct player interaction are all tackled at this complexity level. So for this tier, I picked Dune Imperium Uprising, the latest and greatest from the Dune Imperium franchise. This game has a lot of interlocking mechanics that all need to be understood before you can actually play the game variable methods to score points, multiple in-game currencies, including one that's not really tangible, worker placement, deck building, an auction mechanic, unique troop spawn mechanics, as well as mechanics that break the core of the game's rules, like spies and the asymmetrical character abilities. There is a lot to learn and a lot of rule nuance. Of course, for elite gamers, this is still easy, but that's why it's at level six. It's for people who have a strong base from other games and a wide variety of game knowledge that can all be incorporated together. Dune Imperium Uprising pulls from a lot of prerequisite game knowledge, which makes it something more complex than something like Settlers of Catan. Add on asymmetry, deck building, worker placement, and a unique round structure and it becomes a more complex game than something even like Brass. Now for depth, Dune Uprising is a very healthy 8 out of 10. The game's depth comes from the sheer variety and weighing the benefits from each choice. Which character you pick, which cards you draw, what cards pop up on the Imperium row, it all will adjust your playstyle and how skilled you are will allow you to make optimal decisions with what you're given. The game is so densely layered, like a crusty baklava, and each layer interacts so well with each other that seeing the full picture releases that full flavor of the game. 
The competitive scene of the game is also quite healthy, with many different strategies and a clear variety of playstyles. As the game's life continues, there will be more optimization and more strategies that come from this dedicated competitive scene. That said, some openings, some leaders, and some metas have been solidifying. For example, the Muad'Dib consistently ranks as the top leader from a win rate perspective. Overall, a very deep game with a meta that competitive players continue to develop. And once a new expansion drops, Bloodlines, we're probably going to have to reevaluate this as well. So right now, 8 out of 10 feels right. The Sane Man's Limit. At complexity of 7, we have Root and its expansions, which is also given a depth of 8. The weight of Root is 3.81, and in comparison, War of the Ring is 3.85. Here we are, at complexity of 7, and now we're putting it all together. It's really the point where you can enjoy games as a hobby before you lose yourself to it all. A complexity 7 has everything you could ever want, from Euro games to Ameritrash of your dreams. You're still allowed to be a normal person at this tier, but once you step over that line, you're the board game and dude in your friend group. At this level of complexity, the game knowledge requirement is so exceedingly high, and there's so much rule funk, you actually need to focus in and really study these manuals. And I picked Root and its main expansions because this is truly the limit of what a normal person will ever be able to ingest and understand from a rule perspective. Root has 10 factions, each with a dramatically different playstyle, and each faction will present an entirely new puzzle and strategy that needs to be understood to play. What this means is that to understand Root, you don't only need to understand what you can do, but you need to understand what each other faction can do. And this isn't like Dune Imperium where each leader has a little passive and a signet ring. No, this is a completely different game where each and every faction acts uniquely. At the absolute simplest, you need to learn your own faction and then the three other factions in your match just to understand the basic flow of the game. Even basic concepts like faction turn order, how they craft, how they score points, what can they use cards for, how do they build, what do they build. It's all different and it's all so so different that there's so much to learn. To actually enjoy the game you have to know this knowledge. Like the Vagabond, he's easy to play but he has so much rule funk that teaching him to other new players is like speaking Spanish in Japanese class. It just doesn't fit the structure of the other factions. So it's not intuitive. And Root is an excellent game. It's truly excellent. But it took me about 20 games before I felt comfortable with each of the 10 factions at a surface level. And that's like 30 hours of play. And that's the sane man's limit. Now, as a reward, you get to experience an incredible game. It's deep, it's fascinating, it's cute as heck and it has that excellent decision space that all good games should strive for. It's also an 8 out of 10 depth game, because once you wrap your head around the legal text that is the law of Root, you'll realize how the game sings when four people are all focusing on strategy instead of learning how to play. The game encourages table talk, plotting, and smartly using the strengths of each faction. Each faction is so brilliantly designed, and the relationships between each player creates emergent moments of ingenuity and diplomacy. The only real blemish, which isn't inherently negative, but the game has a ton of whack-a-mole when it comes to quashing the leader. It doesn't really matter how diplomatic you are when you're at 20 points and everyone else is at 10 points. You will be focused and you will be destroyed, which in a way feels like a bunch of crabs in a bucket. You'll see at higher levels of play a thing called Domino Kingslaying, where everyone needs to Kingslay the next person in line. But that does sometimes result in feeling like other players get to decide who gets to win, instead of necessarily the most skillful player. Then again, being diplomatic is in itself a skill, but the game suffers from this Kingslaying dilemma much more than something like Brass or Dune Imperium, and in a way, this Kingslaying at the highest level really does feel personal. And at times Root will feel like the most big brain chess-like game of all time, but at other times it will feel like a masterclass in diplomacy. It is a very deep game, but at its core it is a game about Kingslaying. So I'm giving it an 8 out of 10 for depth. 
Nutty Putty Caven into a Cardboard Cavern. At complexity of 8, we have Gloomhaven, which is given a depth of 5. The weight is 3.91 out of 5, and something like Go is 3.93. So Gloomhaven. Gloomhaven is a popular, it is a hot, it is a big chunky game. It has a lot of rules, a lot of scenarios, and a lot of stuff to unpack, then pack back up. It's the only campaign game on my list, and the reason why it's at this complexity is now we're talking about persistence. You've got sheets with your character information, you've got items, you've got decks and XP and different phases. It's a lot to finesse your way through. Enemy AI, statuses, elemental activation. What do you mean it's a hand management game? You've got hexagons, you've got doors, you've got little traps, you've got everything you could ever want. But what is the cost? The cost is your time. The time to learn and set up this game is mind-bogglingly long. It's one thing to learn the game. It probably takes about five to seven scenarios before you actually really understand the pattern of the game. But it's another thing entirely to operate this mammoth. The setup alone is a good 30 to 45 minutes per scenario. And then you actually need to operate the game's mechanics beyond your character. It's a lot of busy work. And if you want to play properly, you'll need a serious investment of energy to play this complicated cardboard machine. It's no wonder that a lot of people just play the digital version to avoid all of this overhead work. Gloomhaven is sluggish. It is a titan. And there's so much rule keeping, admin, and the vast number of classes, decks, and scenarios just make it inherently complicated to run. Now onto the depth. Gloomhaven itself is not nearly as deep as people make it out to be. Yes, there is a lot of content and a lot going on in the game, which is why it's at that 8 out of 10 complexity. But the actual gameplay is purely a hand management game with some add-ons. If you remember all the rules, playing the game and making decisions is fairly straightforward. The top bottom card designs create flexibility for each character, and you can always make the best out of bad scenarios. But the game doesn't create the mental stimulation that so many other deeper games do. Gloomhaven isn't really an ultra deep competitive emergent strategy game as much as it is a collective journey and hand management puzzle. It reminds me playing a Souls-like game. Yes, it can be difficult to grasp your head around it, but once you do, the game's depth is not as deep as one might think. Even at the highest difficulties, the game feels more dependent on how lucky you are sometimes than actual skill. A bad modifier can completely kill scenarios, just like how one bad dodge in Elden Ring can wipe you out. It can absolutely be a hard game, but once you have a lot of time into it, it doesn't really feel that deep. The decision space just isn't at the same level as a lot of other more competitive games are. So five out of 10 for depth. 996. At the 996 level, we are at complexity of nine. And for this one, we have Twilight Imperium and Prophecy of Kings. It is also given a depth of 9, with a weight of 4.32. Mage Knight, in comparison, is a 4.36. Now, the 996, classic 9 to 9, 6 days a week. This level of complexity is something you listen to in your car, you read manuals in your spare time, you take a look at video guides on YouTube. It's now a job, and you gotta ascend beyond the normal hobbyist to understand how to play these games. And Twilight Imperium 4th Edition, with Prophecy of King, it's a big freaking game. It's got 25 factions, which is more than the number of people who played Concord. And each faction has its own passive, actives, units, technologies, promissory notes, flagships, and strategies. It's got tiles like we're going to remodel a bathroom. It's got so many cards and so, so many cards that I've sleeved them all. And dude, it's not easy. Whether it's exploration cards, technology cards, promissory notes, agenda cards, relics, objective decks, secret objectives, there is so much going on. And I remember setting up my first game and feeling truly overwhelmed. Like I was in over my head. I didn't know how the game flowed together and I read the manual twice and watched multiple YouTube videos. But trying to wrap my head around this game, it's just hard. For example, the tactical action step alone is more involved and complex than some entire games. What variables go into this one action, what cards can be used, how it is broken into movement, combat, invasion, and production, it's so much for a single step, and there's so many different steps in Twilight Imperium. TI4 is both complex from a component standpoint and a rule standpoint. And when you sit down for the first time trying to learn it all, 
you will feel like you have imposter syndrome. There is true abundance in TI4. And with that, there is a rule overhead that feels like you're actually doing a part-time job. That said, Twilight Imperium rewards those who put their time into it with an extremely deep and fulfilling game. Similar to Root, once you understand how everything is linked together, you'll realize the vastness of strategies and ways you can express your playstyle. Because the game is so social, being a tactician is only a partial element of the game, but knowing how to deal with your neighbors and rivals is key to a successful game. Over time, the competitive scene has formed some metas, like the X-1 trade agreement, or the support for the throne swap. But these metas are more to ease the game and make it a smoother experience. For example, the X-1 trade agreement pretty much saves all the time from the trade strategy card that could otherwise take 10 or 15 minutes, while the support for the throne swap enables peace between neighbors from the get-go to allow for other strategies besides protectionism. That said, you don't need to use these. You can go on your own way and discover the vastness the game presents. 25 Factions creates an unreal playstyle diversity, and the game rewards those who are willing to explore and put the time into it. It encourages fun, diverse, and creative thinking to solve in both tangible problems on the board, as well as political dramas between players. Yes, it has a similar issue to Root where Kingslaying is a feature, not a bug, and the blue tech meta is pretty prevalent, but each and every game will provide insight to you as an individual on how you could optimize and master the game, which gives it a nine out of 10 depth. A true cardboard masochist. There is a fine line between complexity and pain, and at level 10, we've reached the limit. This is the most complex a game can get without becoming a painful experience. Yes, there are games out there, like the infamous Campaign for North Africa, or the frustrating Feudum, that are more painful than complex. But we aren't here to suffer. We are here to find complexity and nuance. So here we are, at the end of our journey, into our cardboard abyss, and let's see what stands in front of us. At complexity of 10 and depth of 10, we have Dune plus its expansions. It has a weight of 3.99, which is lower than some other ones on this list, but let's go into it. Dune 1979, Gale Force 9 Dune. It goes by different names, but this Dune is the grandpa of modern board gaming. If Catan was Nietzsche, Dune 1979 is Aristotle. With its three modern expansions, it is a transcendent experience to learn properly. The game is complex, convoluted, and confusing, which also comes with constant exceptions. And I know you're going to say, but Dune is really a 3.99 out of 5 on BGG. That's not that complicated once you actually know the rules. Yeah, sure thing champ, what rule set? The original from 1979, the basic rule set, the MCDM rule set that is some Frankenstein monster, or the advanced rule set with the infamous spice dial in. What are you playing with? Go and tell people who have played for 40 years that they aren't playing right because they aren't adding spice into their combat. Go on and, and good luck. And I've had people who have watched a six hour playthrough of the MCDM rule set come to me and tell me I've been playing the game wrong and that there is no such thing as spice island and that all of these rules are completely made up. It's insane. There isn't an agreed upon rule set and people will tell you with all the tenacity in their heart that their rule set is the one that works. And it's true because it's such an old ancient game. Just coming together on an agreement of a rule set is already a fight. And even if you convince everyone to play with the same rule set, Dune has all the complexity of Root with the extreme faction asymmetry. It has all of the complexity of Twilight Imperium with the politics, multi-step actions and the various phases of gameplay. Dune has the bluffs and the mind games of a social deduction game, and a huge amount of content with expansion modules, alternate win conditions, which all need to be learned before you can play. Just knowing what your opponent's Karama card does, you gotta know that, you gotta memorize that. The thing about Dune is that there is so many exceptions. There are so many instances where you think it might work one way, but it doesn't for some reason. The game manual that comes in the boxes are practically useless. Look, I've had to print out my own step-by-step -step game manual, which is made by fans to actually play this game properly. And people who love Dune have been playing it wrong for literally decades. Want to see people lose their fragile psyche? Try to explain Spice Island to someone who has played as the original real set for 40 years. And tell them you now have to do algebra every single fight.
or ask questions like if a Bene Gesserit advisor can be in a territory with an ally. There are so many strange little situations that might not make complete logical sense. And when you tack on the three modern expansions, it is an unreal amount of content. Sure, you might know the six classics, but they've added six more, even more complex factions, which each break whatever rule you think might exist. Add on the modules like homeworlds, leader skills, tech tokens, stronghold cards, nexus cards, and discovery tokens, and you've unlocked a whole new level of crazy. There's so much to learn, and just like in Twilight Imperium, the amount of content can be overwhelming. But in Twilight Imperium, you can kind of get away by just knowing what your faction does, and for the most part, you'll be okay. But in Dune, you really need to understand each and every faction that you're playing against, which is more akin to Root. And it has so much nuance and so much room for errors and miscommunication about what each faction can do. But once you learn the game, oh man, it is a lifelong game that you can play for decades. It is so smart and it's so clever. It has so much spice. The game has so much depth and so much room for creative strategy. Take for example the classic, the Bene Gesserit alternative win condition. To win you need to predict who will win the entire game and at what round. And if you get it right, you win the game instead. It's one of the greatest moments in all of board gaming where you actually achieve this win condition. Because when you are going for the strategy, it is such a mind game with everyone else on the table. Perfectly trying to weaken or strengthen a faction in the most subtle way, it is such a magnificent and deep experience that is so reminiscent of the faction themselves. Or you can play as the Talaxu and somehow align the stars for the perfect face dancer win against some nerds doing stronghold blocking. Or playing as the Mauritani and doing a perfectly timed enemy of my enemy alliance swap to secure wins against impossible odds. There is so much strategic depth to these factions and each faction is uniquely positioned to secure a win in a clever way. Even the simplest factions, like the Emperor, have such insanely useful tools that the game feels flexible and creative after dozens and dozens of play. The game wants to give you powerful, creative, and fun tools to experiment with, and the factions are simply ridiculous in a way that supersedes the tools in an already nuts game like Root. Add on the politics, the economy, the betrayals, and the rhythm of the game is perfectly balanced. And don't forget, the deterministic combat is perfect because the game is all about varying unknowns and the fight for knowledge. And since the game is such a fight for knowledge, having a strong memory is actually super important. Unlike games like in TI4 where you don't ever really need to remember anything, Dune forces you to recall cards and certain abilities without reference. It's so bad sometimes that the only faction that can write actually needs to print out an Excel sheet to keep track of things. After it all, Dune is a lifestyle game, and we haven't even reached the depths of this game. And how do I know this? Well, because it's actually been played for 40 years, and with the additional six factions, with the brand new modules, people can play this game for another lifetime, and we still will expect to find new depths and new strategies. We aren't at the deeps yet. But you have to find a way to digest the complexity, digest the fussiness, digest the fights about the rules, and if you do, the game will pay you back. But to get that deep, meaty goodness, it takes real work. Well, there we have it. A 0 to 10 list of complexity versus depth in popular board games. Tell me what you think, what you disagree with, what you think about weight, what about concepts of elegance. I've realized I need a whole nother video to do a discussion, but I thank you all for watching and have a good day. Bye.